Karen and I were asked to come along to do lectures this year to share a little bit about our life and our work together as a young couple. And it can be difficult to sum up even a short lifetime in words. So we're going to be drawing on the help of some of our favorite authors, um, authors who have written lines in books that have changed our lives. So books have, have helped us shape our passions and help us make decisions in our life. But fun enough, it was almost a book that stopped us from ever meeting. So we'll start by going back 10 years from now. I had a dream job. I was 20 years old and my job was to walk along a beach in a place called Alicante, Spain and find pretty girls and bring them into my nightclub at night. <laughs> I was also 20 years old and sometimes drinking in that nightclub, um, but I was actually there to study. And uh, I was pretty quickly also being wooed by a life that was far from the one that was waiting for me back home. Um, one that was kind of laid out of graduation, a corporate job, uh, you know, a mortgage in the suburbs. So on this day, I was walking on the beach and I saw a big group of Americans and I thought, great, my boss will be really happy if I can get all these guys into my club. And I'm walking up and then I see this girl. And I say, I've got to move fast because there's lots of clubs in this town, there's lots of guys trying to get pretty girls into their clubs, so I've got to get her in. So I played my trump card and I walked up to all these, there's about 30 Americans. And I said, do you guys like partying and drinking? And they said, yeah, we love it. I said, great. So my club opens at 10 o'clock tonight. I want you to come with me now. It was five o'clock in the afternoon. And I will open the club for you. We'll lock the doors behind us and we drink for free and have an amazing party for the rest of the night. It's on me. Are you in? And I said, of course, absolutely we're in. So I thought I was, I was in. I was walking up the hill with this group of 30 Americans behind me. And I turn around and Caitlin isn't coming. She's reading a book. <laughs> yeah, I was reading The God of Small Things, which if any of you have read it, it's a brilliant book, and I couldn't put it down. Uh, and maybe it was the themes in that book, but maybe it was also a little bit of Aaron's persistence. Uh, but we did end up meeting that night, and we've been together ever since. Uh, so I was there to study, uh, but Aaron was in Spain for a very different reason. So let's go back a few years from that day in Spain. I was 17 years old, I was at the bottom of Sydney Harbour, it was pitch black, I was 10 metres underwater, and it was absolutely freezing. I'd been in the water for 16 hours that day. I was on the final day of my Navy diver selection course. I joined the military as a 17 year old, I'd been tapped on the shoulder to become a Navy diver. And they tried to destroy us for the three weeks leading up to that, to make us as tired and as mentally fatigued and spiritually empty as they could. And on this particular night, I was exhausted. And I just wanted to get out of that water. I don't pray a lot, but at that moment I prayed and said, if there's anyone up there that can get me out of this freezing cold water and get me a hot shower, a warm meal, and put me into a warm bed, I'm really, really going to owe you one. <laughs> and no exaggeration, five seconds later, there was a massive thump in the water and a flash of bright white light. And this was my saving grace. This is a diver recall device, which means get out of the water immediately. Something has gone catastrophically wrong. So I didn't have to tell me twice, I was swimming to the surface. I surfaced on this cold, quiet night in Sydney. I didn't know what was coming next. Were we going to run barefoot to Manly and then swim back? Were we going to do 5,000 push-ups before we would get any food? But what I didn't expect is to run into a small room and watch with horror on television as the second plane flew into the Twin Towers in New York City. And, and one of the older soldiers said something over my shoulder which I'll never forget for the rest of my life because it changed my life. And it was simply this. Shit, man. We're going to war. All of us will remember exactly where we were on that day. Um, I know I do. Uh, I was in the front office of my school. My father was in New York, so I was trying to get through to his cell phone. Um, luckily, he was fine. Um, but, you know, not many of us would have known with such certainty that we were going to war because of what we just witnessed that day on TV. Aaron was just 17 at the time and he turned 18 on the way to Iraq. So I got a text message on September the 12th saying, you're deploying, tell no one where you're going and get your gear ready. I joined a team of 14 soldiers. I had just finished my basic officer training and my basic diving course. Most of the guys in the team were Special Forces soldiers. And we went up and worked side by side with the US Navy SEALs. And our job was simple cripple the economy of Iraq. And the way that you do that is you shut down their oil. So any ship coming out of Iraq with oil, every night we would helicopter above them, fast rope onto them, we would slice our way through their steel doors, cut our way through their booby traps, 
if they had weapons, we would get our way through them, we would put all of them into handcuffs and we would take control of that ship. We do that night after night after night. And I came back from that experience with medals on my chest and people patting me on the back saying, you're an Anzac, you've done a good thing. But I didn't feel like I'd done a good thing. In fact, I felt like I'd done a really bad thing. 250,000 women and children bad. That's how many women and children died because of the sanctions we enforced. So I felt like I needed to do good for a really, really, really long time to right those wrongs. One of our favourite books um, is The East of Eden. John Steinbeck said, you know, there's a great book in all of us, and his was East of Eden. And in that book, he talks about the word Timshel. And he said, uh, Timshel means thou mayest. Uh, and he talks about it in the sense that when Adam and Eve were forced out of Eden, uh, they were given free will. They were given a choice. Uh, to every day um, for the rest of their lives, they could choose to be good, or they could choose to be bad. And the same goes for all of us. We all have that choice when we wake up every morning. Um, no matter what we did the day before, we can choose to be good. We can choose to bring a little bit of positivity into the world, or we can choose not to. We can choose bad, or, or we can choose negativity. So a few years later, we were, uh, we were in Sydney living together, and we decided this is our time to choose good, to, to leave a life of war and to be good. So seven years after Iraq, yeah, and, and five years after we, um, we met in Spain, we were right on the edge of, of yeah, the, what we thought was the best chance for us to do some good in the world. I'd, we'd booked a one-way flight to Africa, uh, and I was flying from Sydney to San Francisco to spend some time with my family before we moved to a village in, in Kenya. Uh, and we were extremely excited. It was, you know, the, the, uh, finally our chance to go and do what we really felt like we wanted to do, what our souls were calling us to do. Uh, but, you know, my friends and family weren't so um, excited. <laughs> they were, you know, finding it a little bit hard to come to terms with what we were choosing to do. You know, we were going without a plan. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money. And we were going indefinitely to live in, in a village in, in Kenya. Uh, so, you know, people thought what we were doing was a little crazy. Um, they, they weren't quite sure, you know, they could understand it. So of course we went. We chose Kenya because we called Qantas and said, where can you get us one way with 40,000 points each? <laughs> and I said, Nairobi, Christmas Eve. We said, let's do it. Uh, so we arrived uh, ready to live a life of peace. And we arrived in Kenya two days before the elections in 2007. And for those of you that watched that, it was a horrific time for that country. We decided to stay through that whole process when many people left the country. Uh, and then we got an email to come down to Tanzania to run a secondary school for street kids. So I just spent seven years in the military. I'd never worked in a school in my life. Caitlin had just spent uh, four weeks doing her graduate diploma practical teaching experience in Surrey Hills in Sydney. So <laughs> she was ready to run a school. <laughs> and we, uh, we get picked up in Dar es Salaam by this wonderful lady from Washington DC. And she's going to give us a few hours of briefing before she flies back to America and leaves us with the school. She promises that, that she'll be back in six months' time. And as we're, as we're driving to the school, we start to ask about the school that we're, that we're going to be leading. And she says, uh, be careful of the buildings. Just choose which buildings you, you want to teach in because the termites have got into the roofs and, and some of the roofs have been collapsing. We said, okay, well, what are the, what are the teachers like at the school? She said, well, the teachers, that they're not often coming to school. Their attendance is about 30%. And I made a joke and said, well, it's great that they come every now and then. And she said, yeah, but they're often coming drunk. Uh, but you're here to bring leadership to that situation. <laughs> I said, are there any kids coming to this school with collapsing roofs and drunk teachers? <laughs> and they said, absolutely, there's around 250 kids on the books, and their attendance is around 30%. So it doesn't really sound like a school. <laughs> is, is anyone getting an education at this secondary school? And she proudly told us that one kid had passed the national exams in the three years before. So at this moment we knew it was going to be tough, but instead of going straight to the school, we get diverted to the local prison, where one of the only boys who's come to school that day has actually beaten up the only drunk teacher who's come to school that day. <laughs> so we spend six hours getting this kid out of jail. We're finally driving into the slum that we're going to call home for the next year. And it's not a nice place to drive into at any point, but at midnight it's particularly hairy. And we're still asking this lady for a bit more information, saying, we don't have much information to work on here before you go back to Washington. 
And she said, Aaron, Caitlin, I'm kind of out of info for you, but why don't you ask this boy? And I look at this boy, he's got blood across his face and on his hands, the police have already beaten him up in jail. This is a community where AIDS is two and five. And he reaches out his hand to me and he says, Mr. Aaron, I can tell you whatever you want to know about this school, because I'm the head boy. <laughs> so we just spent six hours getting our head boy out of jail. <laughs> he was our shining light, he was the best we had. <laughs> and we sat on our little, this, the floor of our concrete shack, which we're going to call home, in the slum, for the next year. And we said, let's rebuild this school. Let's put books in the library, let's build a staff of teachers. But most importantly, let's bring hope back to this place. Hope that if a kid walks into this school, they can change their life. And let's start by getting 10 kids through the national exams and into university this year. We were so happy to be there. So another one of my favorite books is um, The Catcher in the Rye. And uh, in that book, uh, the main character, Holden, is, is there's a moment where he's telling his sister you know, what his dream is, what he wants to do with his life. And he says, all I want to be is the catcher in the ride. And, you know, it's a bit crazy, but that's all I want to do. And at this moment in Tanzania, I think Aaron and I really felt a little bit like Holden. Um, we knew that what we wanted to do was a bit different, a bit crazy, uh, but for some reason it just felt right. And we call this living deliberately. Choosing to live life on your own terms uh, and, and doing what you really want to do, regardless of, you know, if everyone else thinks it's a bit crazy. So if we... Fast forward about six months, uh, the library was full of books. We'd got the farms going, so they were thriving, and the kids were eating healthier meals, more vegetables. Uh, we had more kids turning up for class, and the most important thing was they were learning. Um, we were working really hard. We were up early to bed late, staying up late during tutoring sessions, you know, working really hard, and we thought it was working. We thought things were, were going really well. Um, but, you know, it was taking its toll on us. Uh, we were collectively 16 kilograms thinner than we are now, uh, the result of about five bouts of malaria each. Um, we had, you know, curses put on us from the local witch doctor, which is usually how the teachers who were turning up junk to work um, use their pay last paycheck when we fired them. Uh, we, you know, the, the local police thought we were CIA. The, the, mayor, <laughs> the mayor in the town was not all that thrilled to have two young white kids coming in trying to fix his school. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, we were doing it tough at the time. Um, and we were down to just three staff members for 250 kids. So one afternoon, there's a few minutes before school was up to finish, uh, I looked out and I saw Caitlin in a classroom with about 80 kids. I was marking some papers and then I saw our third teacher, Rogers, a brilliant local teacher, walking past. And I said, Rogers, come in and let's have a chat. And I make him a cup of tea and we're sitting there and I said, it's been tough, I know we're sick, I know we're doing it tough, I know we've made some enemies, but if we keep helping these kids and keep pushing, we're gonna get 10 of them through the exams, we're gonna change this community, it's gonna be amazing. It's just a little pep talk because we're all sort of doing it pretty tough. And uh, Rogers put his hand up and he said, Aaron, you need to take a break. I said, I didn't come to this place to take a break. I came to make a difference, to do good. And he said, no, Aaron, you really need to step away from what's happening here. I said, why, Rogers? Like, what? Let's just keep working. Let's do it. He said, well, I heard some of the boys talking about you this afternoon in the slum. I said, great. What did they want to say about me? He says, Aaron, it's really bad. Because in a few hours, they're going to come to your house. And in front of Caitlin, they're going to kill you. So, so this was a massive failure for us. <laughs> you know, we, we packed up our life in Sydney, our nice, comfortable life, and we moved halfway around the world to hopefully bring some sort of positive change to the lives of these kids. And we'd failed. We'd achieved quite the opposite of good. Um, but, you know, you're probably wondering why we didn't, at this point, pack up again and, and just throw in the towel and head home. Um, you know, why didn't we just give up? And it's a good question. Um, but I think, you know, Friedrich Nietzsche said that he who has a why to live by can bear almost any how. And at this point, we both, you know, I think we cared so much about what we were there to do, uh, about the kids and getting 10 of them through the national exams that it didn't really occur to us to give up. So I said to Rogers, uh, as Caitlin comes out of the class, make her a cup of tea, don't tell her what's happening. And I walked and I found one of the young boys in the school who's a leader. 
And I say boys, but they were our age, mid-twenties, many of them. Many of them had grown up in the streets and in gangs, so they were tough kids. And I went and I sat in a room and, and I'd asked this boy to collect all the boys he could before they left school that day. And I sat in there and I didn't know what to think. I thought, maybe let's just, let's just give it up. Let's just go home. I had a really great life back in Australia. And I sat there and didn't know my next move. But then I decided to give it one more shot. So there's about 50 boys in the room by this stage. And I asked the boy at the back to latch the door shut. So we were in there together now. And I stood in front of them and I said, the rumor is you want to kill me tonight. Well, I'm going to ask you a favor because I don't want Caitlin to see it happen. So do it right now. And thank Christ, none of them moved. <laughs> but I challenged them again. I said, come on, we talk about being men of courage, men of honor. Do this thing. And again, they didn't move. And I looked at their faces, and there were some really angry faces in that room and some confused faces from the boys that it was not coming from. But then everything changed at that moment. The belief that I could come and make a difference, as we could come as outsiders, that we had the answers. So I said, okay, tell me everything I've done that makes you hate me so much that you want me dead. And for the next three hours, they did. And the core of it was this. Aaron, it's your vision, not ours. I said, okay, well, what do you want? Because if you, if you fail here in this school, you know what the future looks like for you guys. So you re rewrite your vision. And they did that afternoon. Caitlin did the same thing with the girls that afternoon as well. And we learned that day that the only thing more powerful than ownership is authorship. A few days later, we are at a funeral. It was the third funeral we'd been to in three days, all for kids under 10, all of them in coffins because of AIDS. And there was one kid at that funeral who was watching his best friend be buried. And he looked devastated, but he looked terrified of what the future held for him. And we realized, Caitlin and I, that change was never going to come from us in that slum. It had to come from that kid. It had to come from the mourners at the funeral, from the kids in our school, from the staff at our school. Change had to come from the people who want to change more than we could ever want change in that place. And we excused ourselves from the funeral, and we walked home, and we talked, and we wrote, and we wrote, and we wrote, and we said, what if an organization existed that went into the toughest places on the planet, found brilliant local leaders, and backed them for once. So we did get the 10 kids through the national exams. In fact, we got 14 through. The eldest is now a lawyer. Um, but shortly after that, we, um, oh, well, Anne proposed, and we got married at the Nairobi Town Hall. Very romantic. <laughs> Uh, we, we came back to the orphanage where we were working in Kenya and had a little reception with the 35 children there. Um, it was lovely. Uh, but, yeah, so got married and, and then packed up our lives once again and headed to the UK, to Cambridge, where Aaron would study and I would teach for the year. But really what that year was about was uh, about fleshing out this idea that was Spark. This idea that was conceived in Kenya um, and then really uh, took shape from the basement floor of our tiny apartment in Cambridge. And, um, you know, we had a year there developing the idea, and then we moved back to Sydney and launched Spark there. And we launched with absolutely nothing. Um, you know, Aaron was working at the opera bar pouring cocktails for a rich tourist, and I was spending my days <laughs> with a four-year-old nanny. And we were living extremely cheaply and, and really tweaking the model and failing often and failing fast as you do in the early days of entrepreneurship and um, you know, at tweaking it from where we launched it in Papua New Guinea um, to launching in South Africa and then Kenya until we started to see what we thought were some meaningful impacts. And it's, it's working now. Uh, there's 235 entrepreneurs that we back across four countries. What we measure is how many people living in extreme poverty have had their lives significantly changed by these entrepreneurs. So they've got a job now, they're getting a great education now, or they're drinking clean water every day now with a, a clean water supply that will last for 30 years. Uh, there's 52,000 people who have had their lives changed in that way, and we want to get to a million in the next four years from the cumulative impact of our entrepreneurs. And we're also thinking, what does it look like to have entrepreneurs impact 100 million people? Because it's a big problem um, that we're all trying to solve here. And the key for us throughout this whole process has been grit. It's waking up and having another shot. And we love The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. And the final line of that book, Nick, he's sort of reflecting on Jay Gatsby. And he says, tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out arms farther, and then one fine morning, 
And that's what we did. We woke, we woke up every day, we gave it a shot, and we just hoped like hell it would work. So it's been incredible for us to be able to share this journey together. Um, you know, to feed off each other's passions and to build something together. Uh, we share the, the great days, the, the fun ones and the successes, but we also, sh you know, support each other through the, the not so great ones and, and the hard stuff. Um, but marriage is tough and building a business together is even tougher. You know, in, in the early days, it was just the two of us doing everything. We were the PR team, the lawyers, the accountants, the janitors cleaning the office for our volunteers every week. Um, you know, it was, we were waking up in the morning side by side and heading to work together and sitting at our desks side by side and coming back at the end of the day and laying down together side by side. Um, and, you know, it's, we got sick of each other naturally. Um, we struggled to separate our work life from our relationship and romance. So it is tough, uh, but the weird thing is maybe it's easier. Um, I mean, you throw in tropical disease and death threats and curses from witch doctors and <laughs> doing it all on the other side of the world without a support network around you, and, but doing it together makes it easier. And you know that you can wake up every day and tip shelf, you can choose. I can choose good or bad. Um, you can choose to live deliberately or have other people choose how you live. So it's been a pretty amazing ride since we met on that beach in Spain. Uh, and it's been amazing to share that story with you this morning, but it's been amazing to hear all your stories in this tent the last few days and around the, the campfires and, and the dinner tables. So thank you so much. Woo!